Right. Thank you for joining us today. We are thrilled for this insightful webinar, Time Well Spent with Our Friends at Quality Bicycle Products. Bill Schumann and his team joined us at the NBDA Retailer Summit held in May in Bentonville, Arkansas this year, and interacted with retailers, the industry at large, in making sure that we are all headed towards profitable moments forward. Today's presentation is a pullout from what Bill presented at the Retailer Summit and it's based on building to drive the industry forward. As the largest distributor of bicycle products in North America, Quality Bicycle Products navigated the pandemic whiplash by staying true to several core values, which Bill will explain today. Through today's webinar, we hope you learn insightful uh, insights. We hope to have an engaging discussion at our question and answer session at the end. And we wanna learn from Quality Bicycle components who interacts with more than 5,500 independent bicycle retailers, how we're gonna navigate the future together. I am thankful for Bill Schumann and Benton Huck from QVP who have joined us today for this presentation. Throughout the presentation, we urge attendees to place questions in the chat function, and those questions will be answered either via chat by Benton Huck as we move along or in a moderated question answer session at the end. Bill, thank you for being here. Thanks, Heather. I appreciate it. And on behalf of QBP, we're really excited to be able to have this opportunity to be able to present to you. Um, we did have a great time at the retailer event in May. I uh, thought it was super valuable. So for those of you who may not have attended, um, please put it on your calendar next year. It was a great event. And I think everybody that attended this year really came away with um, a feeling of time well spent. But enough of that, let's dive into this uh, for the reason why we're all here to hear the presentation. So go ahead and advance the slide, please. So the purpose of what I want to share with you today is really to um, share with you the lessons we learned as we navigated the craziness that was the pandemic bike boom for the last four years. You know, a lot of these choices were, or I should say lessons, were things that we learned some by choice, and frankly, sometimes they kind of smacked us up alongside the head. But regardless of how we learned them, they ultimately made us a much better organization holistically by having to navigate through some very challenging times. Go ahead and advance. But I want to spend a couple of moments, you know, talking about a little bit of background about QBP because it's going to be important as we go through the presentation. So you know, so we all have a grounding uh, base of information to know why we make choices the way that we do. So QBP was founded in 1981 by Steve Flagg and Mary Hendrickson, and they believe they had a vision of being able to offer a wide range of the best products and brands to retailers. And they saw a gap in the industry to be able to provide those retailers those specific products, what they needed, when they needed it. Go ahead and advance. I don't need to tell anybody on this call you know, how challenging the bike industry is. We all live it, we all know it, um, regardless of how it may look from the outside. But for QBP, when we were starting, we had a pretty simple strategy, which was to be the IBD's go-to solution for just-in-time inventory for small uh, parts and accessories. We based that you know, in a single distribution facility in Minnesota, and we really leaned into logistics and fulfillment as the way that we are going to differentiate ourselves in the market. Now, along with that, we also stood up a leading customer service department that really focused on technical knowledge as well as order support. <laughs> Go ahead and advance. Now, along the way, we did start building to the vision that Steve and Mary had about having the most complete assortment of the products that retailers needed um, in conjunction with the brands that we distributed. And that's best evidenced by the QBP catalog and how it grew over the years. And for those of you that have been in the industry for any period of time, you understand that there was a moment where people referred to the QBP catalog as the Bible of the industry. And heck, I was one of those people that was working in a retail store at the time when we printed catalogs. And it was something that I looked forward just before the season started 
because I needed to find those, you know, the latest, greatest parts that I needed to buy, not only for the store, but also for my personal use. Go ahead and advance. Now, as we built out that um, assortment of distributed brands, we developed a lot of really good relationships with them. Frankly, the value that we perceive we brought to those brands is our knowledge on distribution, logistics, and fulfillment, uh, whether it be sales, marketing, customer service, or even just overall product knowledge. And as we built out that assortment's breadth and width, we could also provide them the trends that we were seeing overall, and they saw a great amount of value that we are providing to them. And in some cases, we developed such a strong relationship with them that we ended up with exclusive distribution agreements, which is represented by four brands here on the slide. If we can go forward. But we're more than just distributed brands. You know, we, in the late, mid to late 90s, we saw a gap in the industry overall. There were holes that weren't being filled by others. And we really thought that we could fill that void with either our own proprietary brands or uh, just off the shelf products. So in, in the late 1990s and 1997 specifically, we bought the Salsa brand. And a year later, we developed the Rat Ride single speed frame, which ultimately became Surly in 1999. And it was really from those humble beginnings that we began to design and develop products that were unique to the marketplace and allowed retailers to get uh, access to them so that they could round out the portfolio of products that they were offering to their consumers in their respective markets. Go ahead and advance. Now, one thing that we do is we really work diligently towards um, moving our purpose, which is to advance the experience of bicycling for the well-being of the people and planet forward as we navigate the challenges on a day-to-day -day basis. In addition to that purpose, we have a number of values that keep us grounded as we need to make some difficult situ uh, decisions. Now, it's not a foolproof method. Mistakes do happen. But when we are confronted with the most challenging choices that are ahead of us, it's going back and really leaning into that purpose and the values of who we are that help us make those choices. Go ahead and advance. So as I was thinking about this presentation and developing it, frankly, I was reminded about how valuable those purpose and values were. Because I don't need to tell people how challenging the last four years have been but as we start discussing these lessons, it's important to, for all of us just to level set as to what we navigated through. And as I recall the, the challenges that confronted, confronted us, it's important to remember that it all frankly started with about a six to eight week sudden and severe drop in overall business to kick things off. Nobody knew which end was up when this whole thing began but then all of a sudden it took off and it didn't matter if you were a distributor, a retailer, a brand or anybody, we were selling things as fast as we could you know, get our hands on them. And everybody started seeking out what were the avenues to procure you know, bicycles, parts and accessories, you name it, to fill the needs that were coming through our proverbial doors to make sure that we could help out our customers. And it was going great up until the time that we realized supply chain, frankly, couldn't keep up. And by the time supply chain was able to adapt their practices and to start delivering the product, it was at that moment that the consumer demand started to normalize. And they went back to behaviors that we knew prior to the pandemic, which would be, you know, during the pandemic, we would have customers say, I just need this thing for whatever need they have to going back to uh, an environment where, oh no, now I need this very specific thing for whatever my need is. And it was at that moment that as you know, supply chain was catching up, consumer demand was coming back to normal, the inventories really started to balloon. And collectively as an industry, we all leaned into discounting as a way you know, to hopefully either increase or maintain the velocity that we had, 
but the ramifications of it is it really created just this negative cascade that basically impacted everybody in the supply chain with the exception of the consumer. Go ahead and advance. And it's through all of this craziness, whoop, there we go. It's through all this craziness that frankly, the rumors really started to fly. Go ahead and advance. And so I want to take a few minutes as I'm going through the lessons that we learned to one, address those particular you know, rumors that were out there, but then transition those rumors into how did we continue to work through them in the face of you know, what we were hearing out in the marketplace. So let's go to that first rumor. And it's the big one that's out there. Numerous times we heard people you know, portray that QBP is going out of business. And I'm here to tell you, QBP is not going out of business. Now it is true last year, we did lose money. And frankly, that was a first for us in 43 years of business. And I will tell you collectively, that was the hardest gut punch as an organization that we have ever took. Nobody in our company was happy about it. But we took a few moments, stepped back, got our composure, and we realized that a series of you know, less than desirable results does not necessarily mean you know, a death sentence to a business. So let's dive into some of those lessons. Go ahead and advance. The first one is the need for any business to balance fear and greed. If you let either one of these you know, get away from you, you will either you know, put your business in jeopardy or you'll never reach your full potential. And this is one where we fell victim to this as much as anybody in terms of letting greed get the better of us. You know, so there were warning signs. I mean, product was late getting to us, supply chain couldn't you know, keep up, but we didn't know how to react in the moment if we are you know, frankly objective with it. And so we let those orders stack up. And by the time we started to truly understand the ramifications of what was happening, we couldn't materially slow down the pipeline of product that was coming into us. We had so much product that we filled up all six of our DCs, and frankly, we have some very large DCs, as well as utilizing offsite storage and utilizing a very big chunk of our office space and our uh, Minnesota facility just to store everything. This was something that, you know, I'll say this is one of those lessons that frankly smacked us up alongside of the head. As we say, lesson learned there. Let's advance ahead. The next one is just in time is the secret sauce. Frankly, this is one we knew. We were founded with the notion of just in time and let it get away from us. So going forward, what we are going to be doing is prioritizing, you know, buying less product, turning our inventory more, frankly, to give us the flexibility that we need to be able to navigate whatever the, the marketplace is throwing at us. We realize that there's more volatility there. Now that is something that it's easy to say, but it's kind of hard to do, especially in the bike industry, because we have a history collectively of a very strong pre-book environment, whereby retailers commit a significant amount of inventory you know, in exchange for basically some margin concessions from the various brands that are out there. So as a business, it is important for you to be able to balance what is comfortable for you to actually make commitments to the to those inventory amounts and say you know it might be better off if i take a little bit less product but it gives me the and, and along with it you concede some of that margin but it gives you the flexibility to ultimately be a healthier business let's go forward the next lesson is that, you know what, you make a decision and really focus on what you can control. And so amongst all of these rumors that were flying around, you know, about QBP going out of business, the reality was we were in a pretty tough spot. We were being pushed to, the, to our limits. And we, you know, as I said, 
we had so much of our working capital tied up in inventory, you know, that it really limited what options we had in front of us. And so two very good hard examples of what we needed to do was, for example, three rounds of layoffs from the spring of 2020 to the summer of 2023, as well as you know, selling off this excess discount, uh, sorry, this excess inventory at very steep discounts. And when you look at what prices were, these are examples of things that flew completely in the face of the values that we had. But we needed to make them, frankly, if we were gonna live to fight for another day. And by focusing on what was actually in our control, it allowed us to make those very hard decisions so that ultimately we could get to a better place. Go ahead and advance. So the next um, you know, rumor that was out there is QBP is cutting ties with all of its suppliers. Now that's a good one. And it wasn't completely you know, off base. Um, you know, the, the bike pandemic was in many ways the great product grab that hopefully will be the first and last time any of us experience it. And so when, frankly, we couldn't, you know, get product from our existing suppliers, we went out and sought others who could deliver us product so that we could get that, you know, in turn out to the retailers. But what was happening is that as all the challenges we were navigating in terms of supply chain, once we start, once things started to actually get fulfilled, we couldn't slow things down. And we had so much inventory at a time that we were losing money, we needed to rethink the relationships that we had with suppliers if we were ever going to get healthy again. So if we could advance forward, it's a, the next lesson here, which is to build meaningful brands and offer new products. So this is another one of the pieces that was a great reminder to us about how we started the business and how we were successful. And when we think about building meaningful brands, it's really making sure your business aligns with brands that bring relevant, compelling, exciting, you know, products, you know, to market that really enhance the cycling experience. However, if you have too many of the brands that you're trying to support, there aren't enough resources to actually allow any of them to reach their potential. And you know what? We learned that even on our proprietary brands. We needed to go through that. But specifically on the distribution side, what we did was we leaned into the knowledge that we had about what these brands were known for. Were they bringing important uh, products to market? Uh, were they things that really resonated with riders? As well as be having products that our retailers, our customers could sell profitably going forward. Now, that was a very hard exercise to go through. Um, but ultimately, when we think about the brands that remain in our portfolio, they're ultimately going to be better for it. We'll be able to have resources to be able to better support them in terms of just investing in their inventory or being able to help deliver the message that they want to the marketplace. We could just advance. The next you know, lesson that we learned was having clear real-time visibility into every aspect of your business. So we had to take a hard look at you know, what we were doing and say, if we're not gonna find ourselves to where we were in 2022 and 2023, what actions are we going to take to make sure that we avoid that? And what we came up with is and realized is we needed to stand up a fully fledged category management practice within our business. And what's important to understand about that is it that notion is exactly 180 degrees away from how we were oriented pre-pandemic. Pre-pandemic, we actually set our business up very much looking at it through a brand-centric lens. But what the... Uh, pandemic taught us was there was way more volatility in the market that we ever experienced pre-pandemic. And we needed that flexibility as well as an understanding of what was ha happening if we were ever going to you know, get better at controlling you know, our destiny moving forward. You could advance. 
The next lesson, and it's related to category management, is to identify gaps and opportunities through collaboration and communication. So it's not solely about just managing our inventory. That's certainly a, a big component of it. But what we needed to do is we needed to bring together cross-functional teams that had different views of not only the marketplace, but our business so that we could collectively better understand the different elements to identify those things that are working or not working. And ultimately, that uh, what really provided the value was that then we could start taking action. And compared to where we were pre-pandemic, this cross-functional team is allowing us to be much more nimble as an organization than we had ever had been. Let's move forward. Now, the next piece, you know, here is strategic invest, or next lesson is strategic investments and divestitures deliver favorable returns. I think one of the biggest gifts, and I do mean gifts, that the pandemic taught us or, or forced us to do is maybe a better way of phrasing it, is it really forced us to look at our business. We needed to be objective about what was working and what wasn't working. At the same time, we needed to also be you know, courageous enough, and it was completely counterintuitive to say, you know what, it makes sense to make investments, to spend money you know, in this environment if it would make us better and faster. So to that end, I'll use an example of a, a divestiture, which is the U of Q Institute. A little over a year ago, we had to make the very hard decision to shutter the U of Q Institute. It was hard because we you know, collectively saw a lot of value in it. But as we continued to look at the business structure, we just couldn't make the math work. As I like to say to my team, this was one of those things that unfortunately the juice just wasn't worth the squeeze. Now on the opposite side of that, this on the strategic investments, I'll share two examples of things that whether you know it or not are helping you out. One is pack size and the other one is cobots. So what pack size is, is that as you place orders with QBP, we actually custom make boxes specifically to your order. It's not using just a, a from a group of like 20 or 30 box sizes, but literally custom boxes to that order. And why that matters to you is that whether you know it or not, you know, freight rates are continuing to go up and it's really hard to manage. So what it allows us to do is to have the smallest box size possible that we can ship out so we're shipping less air, but there's also the benefits of using less cardboard and less filler material overall. Now, the other piece that you could probably relate to are the challenges of hiring employees. And during the pandemic, the one thing that we saw very clearly is the order profiles that we were processing on a day in and day out basis had changed. They had gone from being anywhere from like six to 10 line items typically on an order to having literally thousands of orders that may have one or two out there. And when you can't hire, good, hire and retain employees, we needed to look for other solutions. And what Cobots allows us to do is increase the, the efficiency in our DCs while maintaining our cost structure and delivering the service that we had been known for, which is basically shipping out orders, at least by the cutoff time, 99 you know, plus percent of the time, day in and day out. We could advance forward. Now the next rumor is QBP is going direct to consumer. And you know what? Um, we understand how you may think, you know, that that is something that we are going to do. But I wanna be clear, QBP is not going direct to consumer with our QBP.com website. Absolutely will not happen. Now we do have two of our proprietary brands, 45 North and TerraVail that do have uh, direct to consumers um, you know, websites, and I'll cover that in a second. But the notion of QBP, you know, not taking our website to the uh, to consumers is really a foundational element. If you know who we are, 
you know the fact that from our very inception, the value that we see in the retailer base that's out there, we know it is important that in every city, town, village across the US and Canada, that we need to have strong retailers out there that interact one-on-one -on -one with consumers if we're gonna have a healthy cycling industry. And we know the potential ramifications of bypassing all of that and leaving you out of that equation. Now, as it relates to 45 North in Terravale, it's not about excluding the retailers, but rather it's about us building awareness and connection with the consumers. If we're gonna build those brands, we need to have the opportunity to be able to speak to them in an authentic voice from those specific brands. Now, we do recognize in this environment that retail the consumers are buying more and more online, and we do need to be able to provide them that option. But we recognize that while some may choose to buy directly on our website, others will want to go to retailers and to touch, feel, and experience that, and that's when we direct them to you. But regardless of how the customer chooses you know, to procure their particular um, parts, we wanna make sure that the playing field is level for everyone so that nobody has an advantage over the other. If we could move forward. And that brings us to the lesson of collaborate to meet riders where they want to be met. So one thing I think is important as a leader in the industry to convey to people is that we are very bullish on the importance of online sales to consumers. And I say that because we need to recognize that we are all in service of those riders that are out there. And what the pandemic demonstrated to us is the overwhelming willingness to increase you know, the, the way in which they are buying online versus through brick and mortar, which is what we knew pre-pandemic. And I know that can make you very uncomfortable to hear somebody like QVP state that, but what I'm here to say is, I know that you are uncomfortable, but it is not something that you should use that as a crutch to avoid exploring how do we go about that and learn about the options in front of you. Because here at QBP, we have a sibling relationship with one of the other businesses in the Flag Bicycle Group called WorkStand. And they have the tools to help you develop a customized website that allows you to go to market the way you see your business to communicate you know, in a way that you see fit. And they have the architecture and plumbing built into that website that it will connect with QBP and we can fulfill that order on your behalf. So think about it, your customers, they can be sitting on their couch nine o'clock at night in their pajamas and they're searching your website the way you wanna go to market, make a choice, and it's QBP that's ultimately shipping that product to you. So we are not about you know, trying to take that away from retailers, but we think the better path overall as an industry is let's help create pathways that include the retailer and you know, how they want to actually procure parts. So if we could go forward. So that's about it in terms of how I wanna discuss you know, profitability and growth in the business. And I wanna take a few minutes to really talk about things that are more important to us overall. You know, having the biggest assortment of products or you know, our stature in the industry, those are all great. And yes, profitability is very important, but it's not what gets us out of bed you know, in the day, every day. It is really the notion which is getting every butt on a bike that really drives us, which brings us to the next slide. You may think about, and that's, so getting every butt on a bike is QBP's mission. And if you're sitting there going, whew, that's a pretty audacious goal, you are right. Get, trying to get every butt on a bike is very a, a very large endeavor that we you know, want to lean into and it requires a different set of thinking. It's gonna require different infrastructure. It's gonna require us to do things differently. But what the pandemic showed us is how much opportunity 
is out there. And we believe this is a noble mission for us to constantly be working towards. Now, a fair question is, okay, so QBP, what are you doing to try to get every butt on a bike? If you could advance forward. So going back to uh, 2006, we made a decision at that point to, uh, to donate 6% of our after-tax profits you know, to bike community and advocacy initiatives. We realized that you know, we are but one cog in the, you know, the, the bike industry, but what we, and so we're not gonna be the total solution, but rather what we can do is we can be the spark of chain, uh, change in communities across the US and Canada. And so since you know, we began doing this in 2006, we've donated $11.4 million into the Q Community Foundation to help fund these initiatives. Now, if you think about it, you know, this, it, when QBP doesn't have a profitable year, that means we don't have money to be able to donate to the Q Foundation. And I will tell you, that is wholly unacceptable from the employees of our organization. They see this as something that we need to get back on track so that we can you know, continue on with our mission of getting every butt on a bike. You could advance forward. Whoop, I think we skipped one slide. Okay, well, we're just, I'm gonna speak to something that's not here. Um, so be, it's not just about money, you know, for us. You know, there in the last couple of years, we actually signed a 10 year commitment, you know, to inclusion, which really meant that we are trying to make sure that opportunities are extended to segments of our population that frankly have been underserved, you know, by our industry. In addition to that, we have leaders that, you know, really commit their time to industry organizations to be a good corporate steward and help the industry move forward in a collaborative fashion. And beyond that, we have literally dozens of QBP employees that work in their local communities because we're spread out all over the country to help with whether it be cycling specific initiatives or conservation areas. And that can translate into work on trails or safe routes to school, you name it. You have QBP employees out there trying to make a difference. Now, QB, the, now, the other part of it is QBP is a certified B Corporation. And you may be asking, okay, what is that and why does it you know, really matter? It means that we are operating at a very high level of <clears throat> verified, you know, um, verified and transparent results on things that are important, you know, like employee benefits, charitable giving, supply chain you know practices as well as in, input materials and being part you know, being a b corp certified company means that we do need to annually publish an impact report it really details the progress that we are making as it relates to our in, um, environmental social and governance pillars which includes advocacy sustainability uh, community, as well as uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now let's get into the last uh, lesson that we learned. Go ahead and advance. Nope, so got these somehow out of line. There we go. Transformative change requires vision, courage, conviction, and collaboration. Yeah, I've been in the bike industry for, you know, a couple of decades. And one thing that I hear repeatedly from retailers that I interact with has been, what is the industry doing to make sure that, you know, things are getting better for us, you know, overall. And I've frankly, I, I've fortunately been around long enough to actually see and experience the changes that are happening and we are making progress. And so the work that we're doing about trying to get every butt on a bike it's continuing to advance that forward so that we will have a better um, industry, a better you know, culture that will embrace cycling you know, in the future. But we recognize that we can't do it alone. If we are truly gonna have transformative change 
change that you know retailers have been asking for we all have to contribute to it whether you be a retailer you whether you be a brand we've all got to be tracking in the same direction so my ask of you you know as over the next couple of months you're likely going to be thinking about your business for the upcoming year carve out some time to think about what can i do to make cycling just that much better in your part you know, of the US or Canada, because it's those collective efforts that are really gonna you know, lead us to this transformative change that everybody is seeking. I appreciate everybody's time today. Um, that's, that's really the conclusion you know, of the presentation. Uh, I wanna express you know, on behalf of QBP you know, how thankful we are for all the retailers that we serve on a day in and day out basis. And I'm here to say that we are here to be your ally. We want to learn from you. And hopefully this presentation demonstrates that we are also willing to share our learnings so that collectively we can make the industry a much better place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Such a great presentation and it really helps give that great background on QBP and where we're headed forward. I'd ask our attendees now if you have any questions to place those in the webinar chat function, and we'll ask those now to Bill. I appreciate uh, quality bicycle products, and it, and it is true, this last lesson here, transformative change does require vision, courage, conviction, and collaboration, and we've seen witnessed tremendous collaboration from the industry at large, and I appreciate Quality Bicycle Products for continuing to show up for the NBDA and our members in sessions such as these, and Benton has been a part of our best practices panel, and we appreciate that. Well, Bill, we had a bunch of questions at the summit, but it doesn't look like I have too many today for you, um, but I would, okay. I, would, and I would suggest any attendees, if you do have questions, reach out to me and I can make sure to connect you with Bill or Benton to get answers to those. Bill, we appreciate your time today. Yeah, thank you, Heather. And thanks for all of you for attending. We appreciate it. Thank you.